How's it going guys? So time and time again, I've gotten questions on photorealism. How do I achieve photorealism? So this video today, I'm going to show you a lot of the research that I spent the past two weeks trying to learn about photo past two weeks trying to learn about photo you a lot of the steps that I take every time I do a render that's using cycles. And I'm trying to get it as realistic as possible. I'm going to show you everything I do, plus a bunch of the new things that I've learned as well. Now, just a caveat to this before all the comments come rolling through. This is not the only way to get photorealism. Every scene is specific and you have to do scene specific things every single time. What this video is about is things that can work in every single scene. And what I would do is encourage you to go in a little bit even more and learn about if you're doing environments or interiors or abstract stuff. So these tips I'm giving you today are just overall general. So let's get into it. Number one is photorealism is not a button. And I'm saying that because I've gotten a couple messages saying, hey, what button do I use to make it more photoreal? It's not just one button. It's actually a very complicated mess of things you'll have to do that um, just sometimes it takes a lot of practice and sometimes it takes an eye for detail. Now, the three things that is going to contribute to whether it's going to look photoreal or going to look weird and flat is your modeling, your texturing and your lighting. Learn as much as you can about those three things. That's really going to make give you a home run on your photorealism. One specific thing on modeling is bevel everything. Sharp edges don't exist in the world except for a knife, you know, things like that. So if you have like a table, the edges of that table, you have to bevel those. That's extremely important. Sharp edges just are a dead giveaway for CG renders. Now, when it comes to your rendering, everybody's obsessed with removing noise. What I would say is render that thing noiseless, go back in Photoshop or go back in a blender or something and add a little bit of that noise back. Because in real photography, especially low light photography, unless you're using an extremely expensive lens, you're going to have grain, you're going to have noise. So adding a little bit of the back, that back in is really, really important and does go a long way to like, oh, it is real. Because the thing is, one dead giveaway for unphotorealistic renders is extremely clear, extremely perfect images, and that just doesn't exist. Use depth of field and use chromatic aberration. Now I'm gonna show you in this render right here, I use some chromatic aberration and I use some depth of field. You can see on the very corners and the edges, you could see a little bit of that chromatic aberration. Now that's just a lens effect that happens in a lot of photography. And that depth of field is another thing that really goes a long way to making it look photoreal because it looks like it came from a camera. And having just subtle depth of field sometimes will go extremely long ways to getting some photorealism. Now, texturing. Everyone loves the glamorous idea of completely procedural materials. And those are really fun, and my channel does almost all procedural materials because I love them a lot. But if you're trying to go purely for photorealism, it's image textures. Some people hate them. Some people don't like them. They're very annoying. You have to tile them, all that weird stuff. But at the end of the day, including if you're using Eevee, most of these things that I'm talking about are cycles. But if you're even if you're using Eevee, actually, especially if you're using Eevee, you need to use image textures. I personally use Polygon. They're not a sponsor. It's just a really, really good service, but there's plenty of free things out there as well. But if you're going for the highest quality, the highest photorealism, paid services usually are the best option. It's specifically in my case with Polygon, this image you're seeing right now, I used Polygon textures for that. Now, surface imperfections. If you are working on some, maybe some simple abstract stuff or a close up on a cup, if you look at real life, Almost nothing's perfect. Your phone screen, your the table, your TV screen, all that stuff. If you look closely, there is always, and I mean almost always, surface imperfection. So I would say every single time you're working on something and, there, and you are close enough to see the detail, add the detail. Detail is extremely important and surface imperfections adding that sometimes just say adding a, a noise texture with a color ramp and keeping both of the values and more of the gray and keeping that just a little bit of roughness on the ground like say if you're doing a car render and there's a, a light coming down on it and the ground is flat and say a musgrave texture or a noise texture on that and it'll go a long a really long ways you'll see if people do um, home photography things like that they'll usually wet the parking lot things like that so you can get those surface imperfections but the very glossy surface imperfections rather than just a flat parking lot all right 
color correction. This one isn't talked about a whole lot, but for me, I really enjoy it. Now, if you're rendering, use the filmic color space. But what I like to do is use filmic log on medium contrast. Now, what that's gonna do is give you an extremely flat image, but what that does, what log does is it preserves the lights and the darks and all the data so you get this flat image so that when you go into a compositing software, I personally, I don't use the Cycles compositor because it's really, really slow because it has to update your render and it just doesn't seem very powerful for the things I like to use it for. I use Photoshop. You can use another free alternative if you don't want to pay for Photoshop, but going into the curves and messing with the curves and the lights and the darks and going in there, if you use a really, really flat color render, it really goes a long way to giving you a nice clear image and not blown out darks and not blown out lights because a beautiful real image does have a little bit of blown out highlights but just barely but you can have that control in your compositing software. Now on that, I know a lot of people don't like to step outside of Blender to do other things, but the truth is Blender doesn't do everything. If you look at professional CG pipelines, they don't just stay in Maya, they don't just stay in Blender or Cinema 4D or whatever 3D software they're using. They'll render that, they'll send it off to a compositor, they'll send it off to something like After Effects or something like that to do other stuff. So don't be afraid to learn a new program if you're trying to get the best possible image. I know it sucks, I know some things are paid for, I no, that's just how it is, but if you're trying to get that best piece so you can really get that good job, it's a, an investment you're going to have to make. Blender just doesn't do everything. It does a whole lot. It's an incredible program. It just doesn't do everything. All right, focal length. Specifically in Blender, it's usually the camera focal length is set to 50 millimeter, and that replicates a 50 millimeter lens. The thing is, if you're trying to do, say, like a microscopic uh, render, you'll be like at 85 millimeter, or if you're trying to do a really wide angle shot, like an environment, maybe use like a 24 or a 35. One problem a lot of beginners make is they just do weird stuff with their focal length, and that is a dead giveaway for a CG render. A lot of times they'll make it too wide angle, like 10 millimeter. Most photographers don't even use that. And so what that does is you have to get like really close and everything's fish eyed out or if it's really like 120 millimeter and you're trying to get this wide shot then it looks wild. Study a little bit on photography. I would say stay within 85, 50 millimeter or 24 millimeter. Those three are really gonna get you those real kind of shots that you're looking for. Of course, if you're trying to get a more flat shot, more professional, like a portrait, I would say go to 50 to 85. If you're trying to get a wide angle, use that 24. Now the size of your light, if you aren't using an HDRI, which I recommend a lot, but sometimes HDRIs just aren't the best option, you're using something like an area light. The size of your area light is important. Don't make it huge massively soft. You can make it pretty big, but sometimes the distance from your object and the size of your area light matter. So really pay attention to that. Don't just willy nilly put them around. Try to adjust them to give you the best lighting. And I would say, look at references, look at pages on photography where what they're doing with lighting, see how far away the light is from the object and try to do that because that is going to get you a more realistic illustration. Here's a cheat. Volumetrics. Back when I was a beginner and I was making really interesting, like low light, cool sci-fi renders, I used volumetrics to cover up my terrible texturing. Volumetrics is really cool and a really easy way to make things look kind of photoreal, but but it's not really photoreal, but the volume really drives that home. Sci-fi renders and things like that really utilize that because they can make this beautiful render, throw a little bit of volume in there, makes a world of a difference, and you get this crazy cool render. If you look at a lot of um, cool sci-fi stuff like Blade Runner inspired things. There's a lot of volume in there, not only because it creates a cool ambience, but also covers up your lack of ability to make things look better. It's a really great cover up. All right, last two points. Attention to detail. If you're trying to make a photorealistic render, it's gonna take more than one day, specifically because you need to look at it and analyze it. You need to learn and hone in a attention to detail, and that's something that's learned. You just have to practice a lot and pay attention to detail. What's going on with shadows? What's going on with details? Is there dust? Is there different imperfections? Your attention to detail when it comes to photorealism is very, very important. Spend more than a day on it. Work on it a lot one day, step away, come back to the next day. You'll have a more clear mind on it. You can look at it. For me, it takes like three or four days to get something that's really photoreal, like the render I've been showing here on the video. That took like four days to really decide 
if I liked it. And I still feel like it can improve. But that's how you do that. And those are my tips for photorealism. Again, it's not the only way to get photorealism. And there's more things to it that are scene specific. I would say look up Blender Guru and type in photorealism. He's got like three or four videos that are really great, really in depth. But that's how I get photorealism. Thank you guys for watching. I hope you learned something.